Finley the Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania theatrical release worldwide. With the third movie in its shrinking superhero series, Marvel Studios tries its best to turn what has thus far been its silliest franchise into a proper MCU blockbuster, complete with high stakes, intense drama, and important lore tied to the overarching multiverse saga. To Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania's credit, it manages to supersize this adventure while still maintaining the awkward, deadpan humor that makes Paul Rudd's portrayal of Scott Lang so endearing. Yet in its haste to do so much, some of Quantumania's characters, ideas, and plotlines feel underdeveloped, and that's not the first time that's been said about a recent MCU movie. The saving grace is Jonathan Major's show-stopping performance as the chilling new villain Kang. But not even he can conquer the MCU's tendency to get in its own way. Jonathan Majors makes his debut as the Kang the Conqueror, a time-traveling supervillain and the next big bad of MCU after Thanos. Quantumania moves quickly in Ant-Man and the Wasp. In this film, Scott Lang is introduced to the audience and given just six minutes to requaint us with his world before being thrust into the quantum realm to begin the latest MCU adventure. Daughter Cassie, Hank Pym, Janet Van Dyne and Hope are with him on his most recent interdimensional journey. Team Ant-Man spends the entirety of the action in the aforementioned Quantum Realm, where they learn that evil dictator Kang the Conqueror rules. Additionally, Janet Van Dyne and Kang have a bit of a history. It turns out that during the 30 years she spent in the Quantum Realm before being rescued in 2018's Ant-Man and the Wasp, she had been concealing a lot of information about her activities. But in regards to the aforementioned hurried six minutes, you might be wondering what Scott has been up to since Avengers Endgame. Living off of free coffees, frequently being asked for selfies, and being mistaken for Spider-Man, he has been writing the fame of being an Avenger. Even a book about his work as an Avenger was written. In other words, much to Cassie's dismay, Scott traded the life of a superhero for that of a minor celebrity. Hope, his superhero partner and girlfriend, has taken over her father's business and has been using science and the Pym Particle to save the world. To cast an alleged anti-vaxxer as a science-based hero, Marvel's PR team made a good decision, good move. A lot of plot is crammed into Quantumania's two hours, including Star Wars-style resistance dictatorship story, an ensemble Ant-Man adventure, an introduction to the villain that will dominate the next phase of the MCU, and world-building for the Quantum Realm. Quantumania is also the most interesting MCU movie in a while. Even though I'm a superhero nerd, I had to use Google to refresh my memory on what the most recent ones were. Since Avengers and Game's success, there have been eight films. A few have either been promising or too epic to ignore amid the tiresome blur of disappointment. While Quantumania won't be remembered fondly in the future, it at least gets the fundamental good verses. Evil stakes right, thanks in large part to Jonathan Major's movie Saving Kang. But said forgettable fun doesn't start until after a while. The first leg of Quantumania, which will test your patience, is the weakest and most annoying part of the film because different parts seem to vie with one another to see who can distract us from it the most. Quantumania is a far cry from the zany, imaginative irreverence that made the first Ant-Man one of the most underrated movies in the MCU, and writer Jeff Loveness' dialogue is more misses than hits or even how the film's hazy. Everything at the wall and see what sticks visual style, which is best compared to the offspring of Spy Kids 3D and crayons on speed, brings the quantum realm to life. Particularly unsettling are some of the scenes where I could tell that the film was manufactured. Consider what happens when Scott and Cassie arrive in the quantum realm for the first time. I couldn't help but imagine the actors standing on a set covered in sand with what appeared to be a massive static backdrop in the background. Not exactly what you would anticipate from a studio that brings in a billion dollars annually. Peyton Reed, who at this point seems to be competing with John Watts, the director of Spider-Man, for the title of MCU director with the most zero personality films, attempts to create a James Gunn, take away TD-esque vibrant world full of oddball characters with his creation and exploration of this strange new subatomic universe. But all we get is a hazy acid trip of color supported by overworked and underpaid VFX workers. Team Ant-Man divided into two after entering the aforementioned quantum realm. The resistance is being met by Scott and Cassie, who are being led by Gentora a decaffeinated princess from Xena, the quantum realm who is almost impossible to take seriously. Hank, Hope, and Janet are away meeting Janet's former partners and discovering more about her enigmatic past. She was obviously influential in this situation and is very knowledgeable about Kang's history and conquests. But for some reason, we repeatedly see scenes of Hope and Hank asking Janet what the hell is going on, what she knows, and what she isn't telling them. This is a truly infuriating narrative choice. But all she does is hold back information from them until the plot demands it. In other words, a simple email could have saved the majority of the first half of this movie. But somehow, through its poor world building, I found myself sucked into the movie. When Kang assumes the lead role, the narrative really gets going. 
We know he spends his days fighting and destroying entire timelines with parallel universe versions of himself thanks to his introduction in Loki's concluding episode. The grand villain stakes have been raised in the MCU. Whereas Thanos destroyed entire worlds, Kang destroys entire timelines and realities. The way Jonathan Majors portrays him makes him more appealing than the character itself. Majors gives him a tragic vulnerability while juggling an emotionally charged unpredictability with an eerie calm. It seems as though he is constantly just a moment away from erupting in a fiery, seething rage or losing it completely. Majors outacts the surrounding film, just as Tony Loon expertly did in Shanghai, a proof of the value that talented actors can add to quirky fantastical franchises. Although Kang may rule all timelines, he saves this particular film. However, I am powerless to describe to you his skills or level of strength. Paul Rudd is doing what any returning Avenger can currently seem to manage as Ant-Man, which is to show up and be watchable. Cassie, played by Catherine Newton, however, comes across as a particularly whiny superhero akin to a whiny social media activist. Instead, Quantumania is the domain of Michael Douglas and Michelle Pfeiffer, whose grace and dignity greatly contribute to the enjoyment and plausibility of the proceeding. I'm still in awe of what Marvel has done for celebrities who are older and the importance it gives them. Does Quantumania, in the end, make me more eager for the MCU's upcoming phase and its exhausting interconnectedness? Almost barely do you think it would make a good standalone superhero adventure. Partially, please pardon me while I try to come up with a clever way to end this sentence with the words Quantum Realm before I inspire one last shot. You'll enjoy this movie more, I promise. It's my first review, so I hope you enjoy it. Please support the channel if you enjoy the review.